Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This morning, we woke up to the launch of Nauka on its way to the International Space Station. This is a launch which has been long delayed, and it's in fact one of four long delayed launches to space that are happening in July. This module was originally built over 20 years ago. It was originally a backup for Zarya, which is the core of the International Space Station. That was so critical that uh, if that was to fail, they had this ready to go as a backup. It's based on the FGB, Functional Cargo Block design, which was originally actually supposed to be a cargo ship that would carry stuff to the Almaz space stations. But it didn't really fly more than a couple of times as a test for the cargo version. But it did get used as a frame work for building modules for Mir and the International Space Station and after Zarya launched perfectly they had an extra space station module sitting around ready to be converted. So in 2005 Roscosmos created Nauka which is a modification of, of the original design. They added a European robot arm, they switched out a lot of the hardware inside and refilled it with much more experiments and that's what's launching today. Why did it take so long? Well, 2007 was the original launch date and that inevitably got pushed backwards. Um, and then they started to find fuel leaks. They'd failed during testing and the propellant that is on this is the nasty corrosive hypergolic stuff. They just kept on finding problems with that fuel system. First they had leaks that damaged stuff, then they found that there were metal uh, shavings getting into propellant lines, they found shavings in the tanks, and when they wanted to just replace the tanks, they found that tanks were no longer made because this is a design dating from the 1970s. Yeah, um, this has just been a huge odyssey. Earlier this month, they covered it in the thermal insulation blankets, encapsulated it in the proton fairing, and they released a bunch of publicity photos, whereupon somebody familiar with the project pointed out that some of the critical sensors that were supposed to be covered by thermal blankets weren't. So they had to take it out of the fairing and cut up new blankets and cover those objects. So that pushed the date back until finally today. And it worked just fine. The Proton rocket is ugly. It is old, but you know, it is actually reliable. When you get that much amount of angry chemicals, the stuff can't fail to burn. The trick is just making sure that it burns through the rocket nozzles rather than, you know, anything else. The Proton is a three-stage rocket that is Roughly comparable in performance to that of the Falcon 9. Uh, it's obviously a bit shorter. It uses highly toxic propellant in the form of UDMH and nitrogen tetroxide. Has three stages. The first stage and the second stage uh, use hot staging. That's where you basically light the engines on the second stage before the first stage is separated. And the whole point here is that it means you don't have to worry about propellant settling when you, you drop the stages. One of the problems that can happen if you don't have this is as soon as you separate the stage and let the other one cruise, then the aerodynamic drag pushes the fuel to the front of the tank and suddenly you have gas bubbles in your propellant, which is not good for engines that you don't want to explode. The second to third stage separation isn't quite as rough as this. They have these four little vernier engines that they need for uh, roll and your know, gimbal control. And you see them lighting up here, pushing the stages apart, and then the core engine lights up. So yeah, the, the launch basically went off according to schedule, which is fantastic considering the troubled history of the module itself. I guess they've had a lot more practice with Proton than they have with space station modules. Uh, seriously though, it, it's great this is up in space now. Uh, it will have to undergo some tests to make sure that it is able to fly and navigate in orbit. Once that's confirmed, it will start making its way to the space station. But before it can dock, they have to undock the Piers module, which has been used as an airlock for the last 20 years. Uh, that will undock and return to Earth, and then this will autonomously dock onto the space station, and we'll be really happy to have more space on the space station. So yeah, this has been waiting over 20 years to fly to space, uh, but that's nothing compared to Wally Funk. So yeah, mainstream news was covering Blue Origins and New Shepard flight yesterday. Obviously, they were all talking about billionaire Jeff Bezos going to space, but most space people were more interested in the fact that Wally got to fly. I mean, she was easily the most qualified individual on the crew and, and as I've said, has more flight hours than any astronaut currently in space.
And her enthusiasm showed when she was the first person to climb up those stairs, which, you know, again, 82 years old. There's a lot of people that won't be able to do this. There's a lot of people that are much younger that won't fit the qualifications because they're too heavy, uh, they're the wrong size, or they can't handle these stairs, which is part of the requirement. What's also interesting on this flight is we had the youngest person to fly in space, that kid in the back, Oliver from uh, the Netherlands. And I'm going to say this is one of the more bizarre stories about how the person that bid $28 million to be on that flight with Jeff Bezos um, basically decided they had a scheduling conflict. The money was still spent. You know, the money actually has been donated to all sorts of deserving aerospace uh, non-profit organizations. So it's great that's going out there. I just don't know how you have that kind of money to bid on a short flight and then you realize that you have to have your hair done or something else like what kind of scheduling conflict but but seriously this other kid he gets to fly i say he's a kid he's 18 years old um you know and he seems to be a huge fan of aerospace wants to do it at college and more power to him Obviously, his flight was paid for by his father, who's a hedge fund manager. But, you know, I I really hope that Oliver goes on and becomes his own person and does amazing things. But, yes, the flight went off on schedule. um, Pretty much did exactly what New Shepard does every time because it's completely automated. The only real difference was that we had four people on board and we had somebody on the ground communicating with the, the crew as they ascended and into space. So we got live audio, we didn't get live video, but we did get to see what they got up to in space for their very short trip, and it was kind of predictable. There's only so much room to move around. You can't really fly around like Superman, but sure, you can sort of swing and try to do um, somersaults and hug your buddies and zero-G and throw ping-pong balls and skittles around. The funny thing is, like, it's very clear they had to keep switching camera views because people would just stick their feet in the cameras. <laughs> you know, there was a very limited amount of visibility and motion in this whole thing. It's kind of the truth with such a small spacecraft and such little time to do it. It's also interesting to note the whole thing is rotating as it goes up. And I think there's actually a technical reason for this. Because you've got these people bumping around inside it, you want to actually keep the thing stable. So giving it a small, slow spin makes sure that the people can still appreciate some level of zero G uh, and the capsule won't accidentally be given some sort of tumble. Although it's supposed to be aerodynamically stable, you know, you still don't want it oscillating and wobbling uh, as it hits the atmosphere. I don't think I would pay $28 million for this experience, and frankly, I don't have that much money, but apparently Blue Origin have made over $100 million already in bookings for flying on this. I'm not sure where the price gets before I get interested, but all the same, it does look fun. But as a viewer, my favourite part of this flight was when on the way back down, the capsule hits the atmosphere and we get peak deceleration, which is like four to five Gs. It's a lot for an average person. And we can only hear the audio. And what do we hear during this? We hear Wally just whipping with joy that she's (laughs) handling four and a half Gs just like a pro. Remember, this is somebody that chose to go through a lot of the astronaut tests on her own. And... She ended up having to make her own G-suit. Anyway, beyond that, we, we've seen it all before. There was a post-flight press conference, which really was more like an award ceremony, to be honest. The press only got to ask three questions, and there was a lot of excited descriptions of the experience from the, the passengers. There was, um, you know, $100, $200 million given to various good causes, which was nice. But after this, it's going to be down to business, and I expect there won't be nearly this amount of press attention. And in fact, there will probably be a lot of people who paradoxically want to keep a low profile while going this high. They've spent a lot of money on this very unique experience, and perhaps they don't necessarily want to advertise it. Anyway, since we're talking about New Shepard, I expect by now a bunch of you have made some comments on its shape, which is, yes, rather phallic. Let's just say it, it looks like a penis. And I think it's important that we uh, grab hold of this and give it the love and attention that it needs. So this is a result of engineering and physics, right? This was design was arrived at because they wanted to perform a certain set of tasks. So 
The vehicle, first of all, is roughly the same width as the Falcon 9 because it has to be able to be moved down street. So it's a uh, road. So it's like 12 feet in diameter. That's the diameter of the capsule. Now, unlike most rockets that are aiming for orbit, this is only aiming for 100 kilometers up. So that kind of constrains the height and the width based upon the amount of fuel. So that's why it's kind of this short, stubby rocket. But a big part of this look is down to the shape of that capsule on top. And that capsule was constrained by many requirements. First of all, it had to be 12 feet in diameter to fit on roads. Secondly, they wanted to maximize the internal volume and it had to be aerodynamically stable in reverse and minimize the drag during ascent. Blue Origin studied many different shapes. They considered all their qualities uh, and how they fitted into their engineering requirements. And this is what was the result of this optimization for peak performance. As I understand it, if they'd had a more pointy capsule, it would have uh, reduced their aerodynamic stability during descent. But I think most of all, it's the fact that the rocket gets thicker right at the very top in almost the exact proportions as, well, you know, what we imagine. And this is, again, all about engineering. That capsule is defined to be a certain size based upon its aerodynamics. And immediately below that, there is an aerodynamic structure which is designed to stabilize the vehicle as it's moving in reverse. So this needed to be big enough to counteract the aerodynamic forces lower down the rocket that might cause it to wobble or flip around. You'll also notice that it has uh, air brakes and stuff built into this to make it a much more complex aerodynamic structure than you might imagine. Normally, during ascent, the capsule sits on top of that, so no air flow through, flows through the interior of that. But as soon as, as the capsule leaves and it's falling in reverse, the air can flow through that, and that tends to keep it passively stable in the reverse while on ascent making it look like a giant wiener. See, the thing is, this is all driven by engineering and physics, but at some point you have to imagine in a meeting somebody said, you do realise what this looks like, and everyone was just sort of, but the physics says it has to be this shape. Anyway, coming back to my basic theme that this month has been full of long-awaited flights. Uh, Virgin Galactic, you probably saw that they flew. It got much more attention in Europe where Richard Branson is a much higher profile. Uh, again, that had been a long time coming. Originally, the X Prize was awarded like in 2003, 2004, so it's taken them a long time to get to this spot. And the other long-awaited flight is perhaps the youngest of them all, and that's Starliner getting its second go at heading to the space station. This has been after 18 months of further testing, refining, fixing all the bugs that they found, and uh, hopefully it's going to work this time because it'd be really nice to have two commercial crew-capable vehicles. Uh, in anticipation or in preparation for this, they had to move the current Dragon 2 a crew capsule off of the front docking port and around to the Zenith docking port, the one that points at space, so that the approach corridor for Starliner will be clear. And while everything else in this video has been delayed by years, I just want to point out that SpaceX completed a test fire of booster number three with three Raptor engines, and this went through the testing way faster and easier than the Starship test. The Starship test obviously had catastrophic failures, they had frequent delays, but I think it's basically the fact that they've learned their lessons, the, the welding problems have essentially been addressed, we haven't seen a catastrophic booster failure like we saw with uh, Starship, and also the ground servicing sequences, everything, they, they are really starting to move this a lot faster. So there may even be a nine engine test, according to Elon at some point. So obviously I'll be keeping an eye on this down there, and I can do it thanks to groups like nasaspaceflight.com. So yeah, July has been a historic month. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.